Well, good morning, Bridge family. How are you this morning? All right, all right. A special welcome if you're joining us in Columbia or online. Happy Caffeine Appreciation Day to you all. Uh, can we just give it up, by the way, for the people who make and serve coffee today, just for helping us? Thank you guys so much. Uh, this is an exciting day for me because the clock on my car is finally right again, so my, uh, my patience is really paying off. Um, before we dive in, I'd love for us to again do what we did last week and assume this posture of prayer. And if you weren't here last week, really this is something that communicates two things physically with our bodies. One is a way of saying, God, I'm letting go of whatever it is that I brought today. Whatever, if it's fear, anxiety, or anger, or apathy, I'm, I'm just letting that go. But it's also a posture of receiving. And it's a way of saying, God, whatever it is that you have for me today, whether you came with high expectations or no expectations at all, it's saying, Holy Spirit, would you deliver, would you speak and embolden in ways that I need today? And with this posture, let's go before the Lord. God, thank you that you are here in our midst right now. You spoke the world into existence and yet you know our name. God, would that humble us? Would that embolden us, God? Would you do a work in us and through us that only you can do, God? We thank you. And we love you, and we pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, all right, so quick show of hands. Who honestly is a fan of the show Fixer Upper? Any, uh, I know it's a bit of a dated ref. Yeah, okay, so full confession. I know I began two weeks now with the confession. I love this show. I pretend like I don't. I love it. I don't know, I don't know what it is about like transformation shows that like, just speak to me, not my budget, obviously, but they speak to my, my soul. If you're unfamiliar with Fixer Upper, typically at the end of the episode, you end up at the house that looks something like this, right? Usually, you can guarantee there's shiplap inside for some reason, always, <laughs> always shiplap in some locally sourced wood from some forest that's enchanted or whatever. It's, it's amazing and absurd. But at the beginning of the episode, you remember that this house actually used to look more like this. That's typically... <laughs> That's the, that's the transformation. Like, how did it go from the garbage fire at the beginning of the episode to what I see before me? And, and there's just something that speaks to us. We know something of transformation right here, right? Like, many of you are familiar with this room right here. Uh, some of you are sitting in that very room right now. And you may not know this, but just a little bit before this photo was taken, the room looked more like this, right? What an, what an incredible experience for us to see God's providence, his provision to take this and to allow us to be a part of this. And as we often talk about, this, this place is a launch pad. We, there are people literally around the globe who have encountered the risen Christ because of what happens, because of what the Spirit of God is doing in this room. One of the things that I like to say is that Sunday mornings is the push, not the point. It's not ultimately just about what we do here. It's about then sending everyone back out to live on mission together. We're, we're a part of that transformation. But it's not always just like houses and auditoriums. Sometimes we see transformation in, in people, right? For example, uh, look at this young man here. Um, that looks like a normal guy. <laughs> Your laughter hurts me, but that's... <laughs> like he's, you know, he knows where to find a barber and he, you know, showers regularly. He looks, this looks like a guy that sort of knows what's going on. But what you may not realize is just a few years prior, this guy looked more like this. And <laughs> at a wedding, no less. This guy thought that was a good look for a wedding. <laughs> like, did I not have any friends at this point in my life? Pull me aside like, bro, we can't, that's not going to, can we get that photo off the screen, by the way? That's, I think it's, it's, it's freaking people out. <laughs> I got to start bribing someone back there. Um, here's what I know to be true, though, that some of you this morning, if you're really honest, you feel like the house at the beginning of Fixer Upper. 
You feel like your life is run down when you imagine where you'd be today. It's not quite what you had hoped for. Maybe it feels like the paint is cracking, the foundation isn't stable. Maybe you wish you had more joy at your job. You wish you were more patient at home. You wish you had more self-control in your life. And today, what I want to talk about is a God who's not just simply near us, and not even just a God who dwells within us, but a God who transforms. A God who isn't just interested in hanging out with us, but a God who actually begins to change us, to transform us from the inside out. So, so last week, if you weren't here, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, we see this all throughout Genesis, all the way to Revelation, that the Holy Spirit was, is, and always will be the active personal presence of God in the world. And I say personal because that's really important. Holy Spirit is not just sort of some nebulous mist or cloud, the personal presence of God. And in the Old Testament, people experienced the Holy Spirit in a couple of unique, strange, often sort of isolated ways. And the Holy Spirit would enable certain people to do specific things. But after the resurrection of Jesus, after the cross, the empty tomb, he then sends his Holy Spirit not just to simply be near, but dwell in every Christ follower. He's not just out there. He's in here. He comes to dwell, to tabernacle, to set up shop among us. And that's really, really good news. Now, when we talk about the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, the fancy theological word for that is sanctification. And there's a couple of things about sanctification I think you should know. I I had a a mentor in high school, and he always used to say this to us over and over again. He said, God loves you exactly as you are and too much to let you stay there. Does that make sense? He wanted us to know, listen, God loves you fully and completely exactly as you are with all your scars and warts and baggage, but too much to let you stay there. In whatever toxicity, whatever brokenness, it's love, love, love that also then transforms us. So I want you to hear both sides of that. God loves you, not a better version of you, okay? The great Brennan Manning put it this way, and it's always resonated with me. He says, God loves you as we are, not as we ought to be, because none of us are as we ought to be, okay? That's really, really good news for us this morning. So to talk about sanctification, we need to first talk a little bit about justification. Justification simply means to be declared righteous, to be found innocent. It's the opposite in every way of condemnation, to be condemned. This is why when we read in the New Testament, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus anymore. The accuser has no ground on which to accuse us. It's the opposite of condemnation, and it's an act, not a process. There are no more or less justified brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God, okay? You are declared righteous. Christ says, through me, there is no condemnation. It's grace. It's a gift. But I love what the great Dallas Willard said. He said, grace... Grace isn't opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. So what he's saying here is that, yes, first we need to know that there is nothing you could do or say to earn God's favor or affection at all. There's nothing you could do to clean yourself up enough to earn your favor. It's freely given in Christ Jesus. Grace isn't, though, opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. So that brings us to sanctification. D.A. Carson calls it grace-driven effort. We begin with grace, the gift that is freely given, but the transforming work of the Holy Spirit is a partnership. It's a process. So a couple of words on sanctification. Sanctification is not behavior modification. It's not self-betterment. A better version of you is not sanctification. A moral checklist doesn't take into consideration the idols of our heart. In fact, Jesus' harshest criticism were always for the religious elite. It was always the people that knew the most Bible, that stayed the most pious. He reserves his harshest words for the ones that seem to have it the most together. Does that surprise anybody? Because they, they missed what a transforming work of the Holy Spirit at the heart level 
actually does. So for our purposes, sanctification, I'll define this way. It's the state of proper functioning. It's the state of proper functioning. It's setting something apart to be used as the designer intended. For example, we could say a pen is sanctified when it's used to write. That's what a pen's purpose is for. Glasses are sanctified when we wear them to improve sight. A sailboat is sanctified when the sail is raised and it's sent out on the open sea. That's what sanctification means. Here's what I found to be a problem, though, for a lot of us. Myself included, okay? I think a lot of us like Jesus, but don't necessarily want to become like Jesus. Does that make sense? We like him from afar, and we're grateful for the resurrection thing and the I get to go to heaven when I die thing, but I don't want my life to actually look like him, right? Like for a lot of us, Jesus is a great savior, but not necessarily a great role model. Does that make sense? Like, thank you for the justification piece, but the sanctification piece, the transforming piece, I'd rather still hold most of those chips. And again, I'm putting myself in that camp. The temptation is sort of like, "Mm, I don't know that I want, I don't don't want you to have that part of my life. I'm not sure I want you speaking into my marriage or my finances or any other day other than Sunday. I'll give you Sunday. But the, the rest is sort of mine. That would be fine if it wasn't actually for what Jesus says about what surrender looks like for us. So to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, I think it's worth actually looking at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. That seems like a fair place to start. So we actually talked about this passage last week, John chapter 14. Uh, Here's what Jesus says. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. If you're reading along in the Bible, I want you to underline that word helper for a second. To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. We focus on that dwell piece. And again, some context here. A few verses earlier, Jesus is explaining to his disciples. And again, keep in mind, I think sometimes when we get in our head, we think of disciple as just like this strictly sort of educational relationship. These are his friends. And they like lived life with Jesus. And they'd seen some high highs and some low lows. And he said, hey, I'm going to be betrayed, falsely accused, and publicly murdered. So he says this to them. And the disciples, I think, are understandably a little freaked out. That's not what they were expecting from their rabbi, from their teacher, from their friend. He says, he notices that they're freaked out a little bit. And then he comforts them with these words. He says, yes, I'm going to leave you but I'm sending you one who will never leave you. Friends, some of you need to hear that this morning. Over and over and over again in scripture, we talked about this last week, the phrase, do not be afraid, do not fear, is almost always followed by, for I am with you. Jesus says, I see that you're freaked out. I'm gonna send you one, a helper, who will never leave you, never forsake you, will dwell within you. In fact, just a couple of verses later in this passage, he says, this advocate, this helper, this Holy Spirit will teach you and remind you of the things that I've told you to be true. That hit me square between the eyes this week because sometimes in my life, like, don't we have sort of like an obsession with new? Like, not just in technology or in life. It's like, Lord, do something new. Show me something new. Open my eyes. Sometimes I think God is saying, I need to remind you of what you already knew to be true, but forgot. The spiritual amnesia has weighed in. You already have enough information. I'm going to remind you of how I delivered. I'm going to remind you of how I healed. I'm going to show up and open your eyes to the thing that you've forgotten. Jesus says, I see that you're freaked out, but I will send a helper who will dwell in you. That's scandalous, friends. Now, this word helper is translated a bunch of different ways uh, because it actually can mean a bunch of different things. The word is paraclete, and it's translated here as helper. Some translations say comforter. Others say advocate. Maybe that's a word someone needs this morning, that God sends his Holy Spirit to comfort you. Some of you have had a really tough week or month or year or decade. God's Spirit brings comfort. God's Spirit is also an advocate. Here's what I mean by advocate. A paraclete was one who speaks on behalf of the accused. One of the characteristics of the devil, Satan, our enemy, is the accuser, that the Spirit of God resides in us and advocates on our behalf. When that whisper in your ear that you're not good enough, smart enough, successful enough, whatever, lovable, any of those things, the Spirit of God stands in the gap against the accusations of 
the enemy. Now, what I love about this word paraclete is that when he talks about someone who stands up for and speaks on behalf of the accused, the word actually wasn't like in a professional sort of lawyer sense. It's actually much more like a friend who speaks up in your favor, someone who is present and has your back. Jesus says this paraclete, this helper, is one who will bring comfort, support, and help. He will teach, counsel, convict of sin, guide into truth, and tell about things to come. A paraclete is like a loyal companion who continually points us in the right direction and keeps us focused on Jesus. I hope that you have a human friend like that. Like I stand before you as someone who has been the recipient of friendships and mentorships of people who have called me to account when I needed it most. In fact, I I had a a mentor in college. And by the way, if I bring up mentors a lot, it's it's because I'm the product of them being patient with me and pouring into me when, when I didn't deserve it. He said, when finding like your close friends, like your inner circle, he says, here's my advice to you. He says, find people who love you who aren't cowards. People who love you, you'll find plenty of people who love you, but they'll never actually tell you that you have spinach in your teeth. You know what I mean? Like, they'll never actually call you on the stuff that everyone's aware of. They'll never actually tell you, like, hey, man, your fly's been down for an hour. Like, you need to, like, there's plenty of people that will love you. And there's plenty of other people who aren't cowards. They'll tell you the hard truth, but if you don't have any sense that they love you at all, you're going to have a hard time actually receiving that word. Find people that you know love you, but also aren't cowards. We'll tell you the difficult truth. My guess is some of you are probably already thinking of names and faces and people right now. Let me ask you this. If a human paraclete, someone who's like sporadically present in our lives can have that kind of impact on our life, how much more so a paraclete that resides within us, that dwells in us, that's steering us and reminding us, like, no, 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 you don't live there anymore. This is where hope and life and purpose is found. That's our direction. That's how we raise our sails together and keep our eyes on Jesus. Having an advocate spurs us on. And if human advocates can make that kind of a transforming impact, how much more so the Spirit of God residing in us. That's who Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would be. When he turns to his anxious friends, he says, I'm not sending you just a buddy, someone to like laugh at your jokes because I'm going somewhere else. It's someone who's going to keep us focused. He doesn't just simply say, hey, here's someone who w- will offer some kind words and some hope and help. It's the source of all hope and help. So for us, what does that look like to raise the sail? I would put it this way. Raising the sail then involves intentional surrender to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Every word in that sentence is intentional. It's intentional surrender. It's an ongoing journey of loosening our grip of being in charge. We don't just sit around waiting for a divine lightning bolt. There's intentionality. There's partnership in raising the sail, which brings me finally to Galatians 5. Now, a little context for Galatians 5. Um, There's a group of Jewish Christians called the Judaizers, and they and the Apostle Paul are, they're having a moment. They're, they're having some time. The Judaizers were kind of holding to this principle that, yes, it's Jesus, but also there's these like other things you also need to keep doing in order to be saved. And Paul's not having it because Paul's like, I live that life. I've, I've been in that camp, which, by the way, is a word for us. If you make the equation Jesus plus anything for salvation, uh, you've missed the mark. <laughs> You've, you've lost the plot in that regard. And so this is why Paul is so fired up because he sees these Judaizers trying to put all these additional weights on people in order to receive salvation. They were extracting the work of the Spirit entirely from it. So then we get to chapter 5. And here's how chapter 5 begins. Verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He's saying, don't go back to the legalism that you left. Don't don't go back to living it in your own strength of trying to be a moral enough person on your own. He's like, that's slavery. That's a yoke and a burden that you don't need. And then he says this in verse 16. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. 
Okay. So he's talking about this keeping in step, this walking in step with the Spirit. In fact, just a couple of verses later, he says, he says it this way in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. That's pretty aggressive language, right? Crucified the flesh. He didn't just like put it in the basement or put it in the cage. Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So again, a lot of like walking imagery here. Walk by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. I do also appreciate Paul does this a lot. I, I feel like Paul, he's, he's so human because he writes elsewhere. Like, I don't do what I want to do, and I do keep doing what I don't want to do. Does anyone relate to that? You're like, I keep, I keep going to this place that I don't want to go to, and I have in my mind that I want to be this person, but I can't seem to get there. And Paul's like, I, I hear you. I get you. Paul says, our invitation is to walk in step with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. In fact, in the original Greek, the language of the New Testament, the verb tense for this command is in the continuous action. So maybe a better translation, a better reading could be, be always walking by the Spirit. It's continual surrender. It's not just one time at church camp. It's not just this one, as great as all of those moments are, and those decisions are massive. It's not just about, oh, I prayed a prayer sometime in college, and I guess I'm good to go. In fact, when Paul talks about like being a living sacrifice, that was a phrase that uh, I feel like we use in our youth group a lot. It's also a great Christian metal band, if you're interested. Um, <laughs> really good. Yeah, all right. I see that hand. <laughs> I had a youth pastor when I was in high school. He said, that's the thing about a living sacrifice, though, is that it can climb up off the altar. A live sacrifice needs to be re-sacrificed over and over and over again. To walk in the Spirit is continual surrender. It's not just a one-time prayer. It's every morning, every, it's saying, God, I have my plans for the day. I have my plans for the life. I'm raising a sail and asking you to guide and direct and to transform what it is that you want to do in my life, in my family, in my neighborhood, in my job. And the more that we do that, well, the more it just feels like that's what it means to walk in step with the Spirit. So maybe you're thinking, all right, <laughs> that's, that's great, Pastor Boy, but how, how, do I actually, how do I actually do that? I think it's, I think it's way less about these like, big, like, grandiose moments, as great as those are. And I think it starts with like, asking really, really subtle, humble, everyday questions. Qu questions like these, for example. Um, how is God at work in this circumstance? That includes like suffering and grief. For me personally, my instinct when things aren't going my way is often, God, um, how could you let this happen, <laughs> right? Why didn't you do something? What if we began asking, God, how are you at work in this circumstance? Or how would Jesus respond in this situation? I realize that feels a little WWJD for some people. Um, asking that question, I guarantee will begin to transform the way that you actually live your life. Uh, how could I honor God in this decision, and how might God be speaking in this moment? I think those are the types of questions that help us begin to actually walk in step with the Spirit. Because every day, we're either walking in step with the Holy Spirit or following the lead of our own desires. I'll be really honest. I'm more inclined to ask questions like, how can I find the most favorable circumstance here? Or maybe more pointedly, how can I make myself look good here? How can I make myself look intelligent or successful? What would advance my interests? Th those are the things that my, my flesh are inclined toward. Anyone else feel that? And that's, that's my default. Walking a step of the Spirit is putting to death those things, saying that's not where life is found. It's an ongoing surrender to the transforming presence of the Holy Spirit. We let go of our self-centeredness. We let go of our selfish desires. We raise the sails and say, wind of God, spirit of God, you lead me to where you want me to be. Doesn't mean that we don't have plans. We don't have structure. We don't have strategies, but we ultimately say, God, with open hands, I'm, I'm releasing that to you. I'm surrendering that to you. We just did a series called Habits of Grace. That's how we begin to walk in step with the Spirit, by the way, is through prayer. It's through being in His Word. It's through being in community together, by the way, reminding each other, like, yeah, you got some spinach in your teeth. Let me help you out, brother, sister. Let me walk alongside you. And as we do these things, the Spirit of God doesn't just teach us things. 
I believe he actually begins to transform us. Our heart, our mind, our will. Does anyone notice, like if you, if you have a pretty stark like before and after Jesus story, you ever find yourself doing stuff now that like 10 years ago you couldn't believe you were doing? Like I remember when I like really started to take my faith seriously. Like I grew up in a church and I like kind of like played nice, but didn't really become real for me until my late teen years. And something happened, and it didn't happen overnight. But I remember thinking, I'm in small group? What am I doing giving up a Wednesday evening? Like, what? I'm tithing? Why would I give? That's my money. Why would I give it? That's insane. Like, I'm serving on a team. There was just something that God began to do in my will and my heart that, that changes not just the way we talk about God, but how we actually live that in the world. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when we actually do this, when we actually walk in step, and he transforms our mind and heart and wills. He produces fruit in us. Here's the way that that Paul puts it, right in between. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, I want you to make note of something here. It says fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. Here's why that's important. I think when we make it plural, fruits of the Spirit, we treat it like it's a buffet that we can kind of pick and choose, right? Like, I'm going to grow. I'll take goodness. I'm not interested in kindness, though. No, thank you. That is just not my spiritual gift. Paul is saying the fruit of the Spirit, of someone walking in step with the Spirit, who's continually surrendering their life, raising the sail, saying, Lord, you lead me, that's the kind of person that begin to look like. Again, not overnight, not next week. In fact, I would advise you, take your spiritual temperature maybe more every year rather than every minute, okay? <laughs> because sometimes it's sort of like, I remember when I first started going to the gym and some of you were shocked, like this guy goes to the gym. Um, The first time I went, I like lifted once and then I went home and I was like, why am I not ripped yet? Like really frustrated. Sometimes we treat our spiritual life like that. Like I prayed one prayer. I read one prayer. Why am I not like this supernatural juggernaut of the faith? Like give yourself some grace. But over time, Paul says, this is the fruit you'll see. You'll begin to notice. And I think I'm actually kinder this year than I was last year. I I still have stuff I'm grappling with, but I think I have more self-control than I did five years ago. You begin to see that fruit at work in our lives. And another important reminder, we're called to bear fruit, not produce it. I think sometimes we get in our heads that like, I need to like grit down and just tough it out and become more of these things. We talked about this last week when Jesus says, I'm the vine, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Abide in me and you'll bear fruit. Don't. And you won't. We get into our minds, though, that it's on us solely to grow these things. No, sanctification, this transforming, it's a partnership. We work in conjunction with, we're called to bear fruit, not produce it. And this fruit comes from obedience, walking in step with the Spirit. The great Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it this way. He says, fruit is always the miraculous. Always. When, it, when a human heart begins to look more and more like Jesus, that's a miracle. That's a big deal. Fruit is always the miraculous, the created. It is never the result of willing, but always a growth. The fruit of the Spirit is a gift of God, and only He can produce it. They who bear it know as little about it as the tree knows of its fruit. They know only the power of Him on whom their life depends. Some of you are a testament to that this morning. And you need to remember that. Maybe you feel like a rundown house today. You need to remember, you need the Holy Spirit to remind you where you came from. Remember the work that has happened. You may still have a long road to go. Join the club. Join the club. But God is faithful. And he's doing a work in us. He's producing fruit in us that we can't produce our own. We can still dream and strategize and organize, do all of that. But eternal fruit, fruit that matters, by the way, comes from God alone. Come from God alone. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So may we be a people who walk in step with the Spirit. To be in his word together. 
to pray and not feel like we always have to do all the talking. In fact, I want to challenge you this week to just pray this prayer every morning. Simply, God, I'm open to your Holy Spirit. Make me ever aware of your presence dwelling in me. Speak to me, transform me, empower me to be more like Jesus. God, I am open to your Holy Spirit. Amen. What would happen if we just began with that simple prayer? I'm open, God. I don't know what kind of transforming work you want to do, what places you want to lead me, but I'm open. And when you think about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, do those traits remind you of anybody? I think they describe Jesus. When we're open to the Spirit, we'll be transformed to be more like Him. In fact, the Apostle Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians. He says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We're being transformed. And then he ends this way. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're being transformed, church. And maybe you feel like the paint is chipping and the foundation is cracked. But God sees what you're becoming. He sees who you're becoming. If you've ever walked in on anyone who's like, a craftsman who works with like wood or clay or paint, you maybe walk into their space and just looks like a mess, right? Like there's just stuff everywhere. Maybe yours, your life feels like a mess today, but you ask the craftsman, no, oh, I see what this is becoming. Sure, it may look like a mess right now. I have a plan, a design. I see what they're becoming. God is more excited to transform our lives than we even are to surrender them. He wants to. That, to me, is the great scandal of the whole thing. It's not just that he can and that he does, church. Do we know that he wants to? He wants to lead us to life everlasting, to life abundantly. He doesn't want us stuck in patterns of sin and toxicity. He wants to bring restoration and healing to our city and our family and our church and our world. We get to be a part of that. What a gift that he would not only know us by name, but allow us to join him in the work. We don't work for God's affection, but we most certainly work from it. We don't do these things in order for him to love us because he already loves us beyond measure in Christ Jesus. But then he says, let's get to work. The spirit is ready to do the work of transformation in our lives. He wants to do something new in us and through us. And the question is, will we be open? Let's pray together. God, thank you that amidst all of our brokenness, amidst all of our shortcomings, God, amidst all of the things that we know we bring to the table, thank you for continually coming after us. God, when we could do nothing to earn or deserve your favor, your affection, God, thank you for your grace and mercy, God, that your Holy Spirit stands in the gap against accusations from the enemy, God, that you are doing a transforming work in us and I believe through us, God. Help us to keep raising that sail together. Wind of God, would you guide us? Would you direct us? Would you be the source of life and vitality, not only of us individually, but Bridge family together as a community, as a body, your body, God. Thank you. Thank you for never leaving us, never forsaking us, for dwelling in us, God. Help us to walk in step with you. And we pray all these things in the beautiful, in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. 
Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.